<laughs> oh no, that's right. I remember now. It was, we yeah. were we were playing Huntington Castle, and then and I accidentally played Loch Nagar, and I thought that we could take that's a look great. at it tonight. Yeah, that's, great. that's what we'll do. Yeah, and what a great tune. I was working with somebody on that tune today, and he's a gentleman who is really trying to work on his intonation. He's very frustrated. Uh, and he's like, as soon he's talking about as soon as the tempo goes up a little bit, he gets really, really out of tune. And it's a very common kind of complaint. And Claire, you were talking about that, eh? except you were talking more about your bow uh, uh, when you get going both. fast. Both. both. Yeah, both for sure. And, and I'll tell you what happens with both of those things. It's such a common problem, one I've run into quite a lot. And I'll start with the intonation because that's what I was talking to uh, Earl about today and for him he felt like he's chronically flat and I certainly I listened to him playing a little bit and certainly definitely had that problem and so the problem was finger pressure uh, now I don't know if I've, I'm sure if I've explained to you guys about the finger pressure eh? and, uh, and I've demonstrated how much finger pressure can sharpen you and, and how you can use it to flatten you to a certain extent and so I showed him that, and it was news to him. He had never heard of that. And then so well, we worked on drop downs on the D, on the on the A string, because I find that's the best place to start. We did a bit of that, got a little bit better, and we then we were talking about applying that to a tune. And, you know, it's one thing to, to work on your intonation, uh, like, on its own, in abstract like that. Yes, I see you, drum, just in mid-sentence. I want that social nice thing, like, in much color. That cupboard I was telling you about with everything crammed into it. Um, which side? Left or right? On the right. Right, okay. Uh, anyway, uh, so when you bring it to a tune, that's a different story. So I was telling him about goal notes. And that's the way you get a tune in tune. You take few, three notes and you make sure you try to play those notes in tune every time because nobody can play every note in tune there's just you know there's nobody's perfect my dad used to say there was one perfect man and we killed him didn't we uh, so there's no point to it either especially with our music nobody nobody would ever play a hundred percent bang on all the time it's just you know we just don't do it so what we do instead is we try to get you know most <laughs> And the, to use goal notes to do that is the best way because I usually choose or help people choose arpeggio notes in the key that you're playing in. So uh, Earl was playing in D, Loch Nagar, so we use D, F sharp, and A as goal notes. Try to get them all in tune. And then I, he said, well, the open day is fine. And I said, well, yes, but you can flatten yourself on that too. And I showed him that. And so that was his goal. His goal was to play the opening phrase of Loch Nagar with the D's intact, the F's intact, and the A's totally intact. And it worked. It took three or four times, and he was getting more reliable, see? And so that's the best way to do that, because what happens to the, to the intonation when the tempo goes up is that you fail to bring in that pressure that you need, because the notes are moving so quick. And so it's, it's kind of like a hurdle you get over with intonation because you spend so much time making an attempt at a note and then you see your flat and you add the pressure, now you're good, right? So that's kind of half a note that's good. When you're talking about a big string of eighth notes, you don't have time for that. See, you, you lose half of those. So you have to figure out a way to make it still in there even though the notes are flying around your helmet. Usually it's to apply pressure across the board. Just press a little harder across the board with all the notes and usually things come, you know, up a little bit that way. But it also has to do with listening and listening for the ringing of the notes on the fiddle, okay? So that's the deal with playing flat for most people. All right. Not everybody plays flat. Some people tend towards the sharp. That I find is a different problem. I find that the sharp is a mechanical problem where the hand keeps coming up the neck as you play. And it's made worse by uh, speed because when you go fast, your body wants to tense. It wants to... <clears throat> for some reason. I, when I first started teaching, I, I always wondered why people tensed their right arm when they go faster. And I asked a guy once, and he said, I, well, because then I got the spring-loaded action, right? It helps me, right? 
<laughs> Which, you know, I can understand why you might think that. But so when you tense up, that's when your hand really wants to come up the fiddle. Especially if you have any pinching power on the fiddle at all. If you're pinching that neck of that fiddle with your thumb and forefinger, when you move from G to E, G to E like this, up she comes. Just like those toys you get at Christmas with the guy that shimmies up the telephone pole. Exactly the same action. And if you got a bit of tension there, your arm already wants to come up, it'll come up within two bars. And then you're sharp, right? It's very frustrating. Now, the, I also was teaching him how to recognize the sound of playing flat and recognize the sound of playing sharp. Flat is boring and, and, and sad sounding. It makes you want to do this. And uh, sharp has an edge and it actually bothers your ear. It actually kind of assaults your ear a little bit and it makes you kind of move away from the instrument. So that's what I've noticed for, for when you're tending towards sharp or flat. So if you hear that sad sound, you apply a little pressure across the board, you're gonna come up bright. See that? And if you hear that edge, that oh, then you relax back to place. You relax the hand and arm and you'll roll back into your home base and you stay there. And I was explaining to Earl that it even happens to me. So when I'm playing a dance, which is hard work, three and a half, four hours of straight playing at 120 beats a minute, I get tense too. And I have a little tell, the skin on the side of my hand. If I feel that starting to pull backwards like this, I know that my hand is starting to come up. And I relax until I feel that skin go slack again and I know I'm in the right place. See that? So that's, that's the, the deal about playing fast in tune. That's how you have to do it. You have to figure out your tendency, do the thing that corrects the tendency, hi Simone, uh, whether it's flatness or sharpness, and try to put it into practice using goal notes in a tune. Okay, of course, it's always better to do it right after you've practiced the scale and the arpeggio of the key of the tune then you'll have a better batting average. And I've also noticed that a little bit of attention to that, when you see the tuner turning green, you hear the nice bright sound, you start to learn how your violin's supposed to sound when you're playing in tune, and you'll wonder less, okay? Now, talking about Claire's uh, thing about the right hand, uh, I mean, you were talking about both, but now talking about the right hand, so, so Claire, you were, t you were saying that as soon as we start to go fast, you feel like your bow goes all over the place. Yeah, it's like not perpendicular to the fingerboard. Yes. That's what I mean. Yes, I, yeah. I, I totally understand. And that is also a tension issue, okay? Now let me demonstrate. It's such a common problem. This is going to help a lot of people. So the bow hold, first of all, as you guys know, and I'm sure I've explained ad nauseum, the bow hold is supposed to be dynamic. So the, so the bow is supposed to be loose in your fingers, eh? Like, it's supposed to be fit, sitting on top of your fingertips, and it's supposed to be like a trailer hitch, totally loose and allowed to pitch and move there in your fingers with, with a little bit of play there. See that? Now, when I get going fast, if I, if I tense that grip, if I start to grip on the bow, then the bow stops move, being allowed to move in a straight line and starts to follow your hand. See that? And it really goes all over the place. Now see if I can demonstrate. So I'll start off good, and then I'll start to tense this bow hold. Now you see how that's working there? And all I did was pinch on the bow a tiny bit as I was playing. And then suddenly it has no choice. It has to follow whatever your hand does. And I can guarantee your hand is not going to be at the right angle. See what I mean? So a very loose bow hold is really important. And you guys know how to strengthen that idea of a very loose bow hold is the spider crawl. It's the best way to do it. See that? You get nimble with those fingers on the, bow, on the stick of the bow so that you're not kind of death gripping it. You're just gently holding it like that, very nimble, and that's gonna loosen up your grip so that you don't do it. Now, of course, the other cause, how you doing there, Susan? You're getting it. It's working. Uh, the other cause of the bow going haywire when you're trying to go fast 
is the wandering elbow. Now, I can't tell whether that's your problem because I can't really see your elbow while you're playing, but I'll tell you, it's one of the most common problems in the world. And uh, that's why you use the doorway. Best way to do that. And so for some people, you know, the doorway is really great for skills training. So regular scales and arpeggios, long bows, really, really good. Keeping that bow straight, just like this, I'll show you. So elbow in front of the door frame. And I'm just going to do nice long bows. See that? And I'm getting a little touch there. When I finish my down bow, it's touching that doorway a little bit. See that? And that's correcting me. That's making my elbow stop wandering around and stay in place. See that? Just a gentle little touch is all you need. And even if I try to go change strings with my elbow, it's going to hit me. It's going to rub me. And I know I'm doing it. And it really does help to calm you down to stop that elbow from going all over the place. Because that's a very common thing too. <laughs> See that? And, and the same thing. You might be okay doing slow scales and arpeggios. You look good. Your arm looks good. But then when the tempo goes up, this turns into this. And then it's death. <laughs> so that could be the contributing factor for that bow going haywire when we reach a certain mm -hmm. tempo. Okay? And so to keep the bow hold loose is the biggest advice. And the doorway could help too. Okay, does that help? What do you think you were doing? Do you think you were pinching? Or is it elbow or is it a bit of both? I think probably both. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> probably. I haven't, I haven't tried the doorway thing for a long time. Yeah, but I do remember that you did some work on it and that work usually stays in there. Now, yeah. it, it doesn't mean you're done, of course. Nobody's ever done at getting better at these things. So doorway time is always good. Always. Like for, for a lot of people, I just tell them to just put their chair somewhere where there's something that they can touch their elbow and do the whole practice that way. You know, it's really good. It's really good. My brother had us doing it for years when we were little, right? So right until I was like 12, we were playing in the doorway. And if we had trouble with stuff, he would tell us to go to the doorway. You know, for that reason. So anyway, so I think that might help you, but especially the grip thing. So why don't we do some, why don't we do a little bit of grip work with the bow? We'll do the, uh, we'll do a couple of spider crawls and we'll do some bow push-ups. Let's do that right now. Hey Dad. So I'm just waiting for my rice to cook up there. Oh, good. Eh. And you'll never guess how lucky I was. There was exactly enough rice in the thing. Aren't you lucky? Me, yeah. Do it. Aren't you lucky? It also brings to my attention we're out of rice. Thank you for telling me that. We also only have four cans of tuna left. Thank you for telling me that too. It's my foodie son. He made three dips for crackers on the weekend that were absolutely delicious. Wow. Yes, and they, the kids did a cooking course at an uh, uh, online cooking course on Friday. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sylvia made macarons. You know, those what? Italian cookies, and they came out perfect. No Italian, they're French. Oh, you're right, Jerome. Yeah. <laughs> and Jerome here made, uh, like, uh, what was it, glazed chicken? and, and Glazed chicken, special mashed potatoes, cookies, and green, and, uh, green bean and almond dish. Yeah. It was delicious. <laughs> Anyway, how are we doing with your spider crawl? Anybody having yeah. trouble? Can you do it? Can everybody do it? I forgot how much fun this is. You're do you got the stick upside down. That's an added challenge there, Diana. That's very, very skillful, man. You got uh, even upside down she was doing it. That's awesome. <laughs> it is a challenge though, eh? Like, especially on the way up. And avoid this here. Your your pinky is gonna wanna do that. Grab on the other side of the bow like this, but don't do that. Keep it on, keep it on this side, because uh, you never get to do that when you're when you're playing. <laughs> okay. Now, now that you've done your spider crawl and it's looking pretty good, does anybody have questions about it or problems? No. Now let's do some bow push-ups. So here's my down. 
here's my up. Here's my down. Here's my up. Looking good, Claire. That's it. That last one was perf. That's good. And you notice how my thumb is curling up too. Very important because that's yeah. the other side. That's the other side of the shock absorbers. Right. Okay. All right. Looking good. Looking good, everybody. So this is really, really good stuff for that for that gripping that I was talking about to avoid the gripping. Okay. Now the next thing we'll do is we're going to do some. Oh, is there any questions or problems about the bow push-ups? Everybody able to do it? You just got to be careful that you're not actually just doing this because that's not bow push-ups. That's just turning your wrist. This is a bow push-up with your fingers here. See that? That's what we're trying to do. Okay. And for all you guys, it would be very, very good for you to work on this idea for all you guys. Okay. Because you're trying to be fiddle players. And you know, the violinists that I know, they envy my right hand because of the, the, my ability to go back and forth like this. And it's because of that. Because fiddle players have a harder job when it comes to that. So we got to get better than the classical guys at turning around our hand. Now, let's do a little bit of jiggle. Okay? So we'll start with uh, our regular scale. First of all, we'll play it regular mode. And then we're going to do it jiggled. Okay? And we're going to see if you can feel all that stuff we just did. See if you can feel a little bit of the effects of it on your bow hold, okay? So I'm just gonna mute everybody here. All right, so first of all, we'll do our regular old G major scale. Make sure it's working good. I have my, I've, I've downloaded my tuner onto my computer, so now it's really big and on my screen, which is much better. But uh, it's a little pickier because I think it's got a better microphone. So it's kicking my butt a little bit, I have to say. I'm just gonna check my intonation. It's also frozen. It does freeze. Tunable does freeze sometimes. It's kind of annoying. There we go. Okay. in tune. Okay, so now we're going to do it and we're going to jiggle. I'm just going to put some rosin on your bow here. There we go, that'll do. A little dab will do ya. Okay, so we're going to jiggle. Yeah, we'll 
I'll do a good, good number, same number of jiggles per note is what you're going for. So I'll count you up. One, two, three, go. started to tense up during that like yes okay and that's what happens all right that's now a couple of things you can do about it there's not much you can do about it besides relax uh, but apparently exhaling on the down bow the next available down bow if you can get if you can let a breath out then chances are you're gonna let a breath in and that will help you not tense okay because as it goes on that's the danger that's when the danger comes in is, as it goes along. Let's do it again, shall we? Same exact thing, except much better. I'm gonna make my tuner a little bit bigger. It's kind of off to the side. And I never trust myself. Okay. Okay, here we go. Oh, one. Two, three, go! Take a tune like, uh, let's see, what would be good to do it on? Like, uh, maybe You Are My Sunshine? Did you have, have we ever done that? <laughs> let's see, maybe not. Maybe we'll do, uh, um, what, uh, Black Velvet Band. Remember Black Velvet Band? So it would, first of all, just to remind you, oh, Pearl likes Black Velvet Band, me too. So that's Black Velvet Band. 
And, uh, and to jiggle Black Velvet Band, it would sound like this. problems with that or anything I can help with no? I am that one. you don't have that one so it's let me see if I have music for it I'll just send it to you quick Sorry. oh it's all right man it's easy as pie black Felt. um we don't have that either if okay you can send it. thank you no problem and plus how good are you at making pie Dan McDonald at making pie? Yeah. Not very good. I've, Jennifer, Thank much you. better than me. See? <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see here. I don't know if I have music for it. You know what? You guys did not do Black Velvet Band. I'm getting that. I'm getting you mixed up with the uh, with the beginner class. The beginner class did Black Velvet Band, and they learned it totally by ear. Uh, so, uh, let's see. What should we pick? Well, let's do a slow air. What slow airs have we done? Anybody remind me? Well, we did Ashokan Farewell, and we did that Huntington Castle. Okay, let's do... First of all, why don't we work with Huntington Castle? That's a really good one. <laughs> Anyway, let's practice Huntington Castle. That would be really, really good. And then we'll try jiggling it, okay? So we'll just play it first, just regular, get it under the fingers. <laughs> Castle. One, two, three, one, two. try it jiggled shall we we'll just jiggle right through the whole damn thing 
And this is kind of going to hopefully teach you how to get that hand going and everything like that and try not to tense up as you do it, okay? Here we go. Oh, one, two, three, one, jiggle. first so first of all I started off great no problems at all as I went along I started to feel tension come into my arm and the biggest place that I felt it and was able to deal with it was that my arm was do started to do it instead of my hand eh? and I noticed that I and I so then I was able to kind of concentrate on it and make sure my hand was still doing it uh, and it was like I think I was halfway into the second time through the first part when I started to notice that. And I noticed it twice more in the second part and in the repeat, I noticed that coming in again. And I had to really concentrate and I was using my zoom window. I was looking at my zoom window to see what was happening there, really trying to see the results and it worked. And I was able to stay loose right through the whole thing. Okay, now how about everybody else? Who was able to stay loose and who tensed up? I tensed up when I think my biceps need Volterran. Your biceps! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. So that, yeah, so the tensing up means you're going to be using your bicep, right? Instead yeah. of your, your, the little muscles, yeah. And the bicep is a huge muscle and can't take much of that particular behavior for sure. So, okay, well, that's all right. And the other thing is to take breaks. So you, when you're jiggling through a piece like that, just stop for a minute and then come in on the next phrase with a fresh fresh loose wrist okay very good though very good anybody else have an experience yeah yeah i'd say i was just saying it was my bicep so i'm not using my my i'm not loosening up my wrist enough i guess yeah did, was it like that throughout or did you notice it come in uh maybe as we got through it more yeah right? okay okay so you can start off good so it means you just got to keep going back to there anybody else have anything to share um, I noticed that my pink, like, uh, my pinky was coming up so much that it was hard to control a bit. Your pinky was off the bow? Yeah. Do you notice that mine is off the bow when I'm doing it too? <laughs> See that? Now, one thing that might help is where you do it in the bow. And that's one thing I was noticing. Very hard to do it in the middle. Okay, because it jumps on you. And the middle, anywhere past the middle is where you really do need your pinky, right? You really need it to be on there. So if you do it up here, you don't need it. You could just take it right off. And then you get a really good long sweep, see that? Without using your arm. So that might help. Okay, don't need it. How about you, Claire? 
Yeah, I was going to say, I, I noticed more tension in my shoulder. Okay, yeah, yeah. But I think when I'm, that's my signature thing that I always do anyway. When I feel tense, I go like this. Yes, I'm with you. Always. Yeah. So I think that I'm just starting to do that, but it doesn't help because, you know, then your whole arm gets out of whack. And maybe that's why my bow is going all over the place the, sometimes. The tension? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I would bet money on it for sure. Yeah. Okay? So I have to pay, pay some heed to that, you know? Yeah, and I think if if you were if you were actually feeling it in your shoulder, then the doorway is gonna help you. Okay? Yeah. Because you know they say the bow arm, like when they're working on the bow arm, the first thing they do is stop people from bowing with the shoulder, right? And then it's to the elbow, and then it's to the this. <laughs> See that? And I really like that idea. Like they used to say in the Royal Conservatory, everything you do with the bow on this big scale, you have to do all the same stuff on the small scale. See that? I call it my first bow arm, and this is my second bow arm. This is what what does most of the work, and this is what does some of the work, you know? So, yeah, so I think the doorway would definitely help you. All right. Now, what about the young kids? You probably didn't feel anything at all doing that. You could do it all day long. How was your experience doing the jiggle? How about you, Kalida? Yeah, I think... It was like, okay, but yeah, I definitely felt like my pinky coming off, so, you know, like, it was coming on and off, so maybe if I played, like, higher up, then it would just, like, stay off, and then, like, I wouldn't have to, like, worry about it. Yeah, um, and I think you were one of the people in the, kind of in the middle of the bow, where you kind of need your pinky, and it does make it a little bit harder. Yeah, good point. Okay, well, why don't we try it again? Same thing. Uh, and if anybody has anything else they want to add, please just charge in there. But let's do it one more time with the Huntington Castle jiggle <laughs> and uh, and see if we can keep that uh, everybody loose. We're going to stay loose. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. Remember to breathe. Oh, one, two, three, one, two. up once it was in the second part and it was on the repeat is when I felt I had I noticed that it was and when I, I was looking at my zoom new window it's very easy to see it's just this turns into this see that and you can see that little movement there and I know it's my arm okay so that is something to work on does that help everybody do you think that's gonna help to get a little bit looser with the bow hold and be able to move the bow back and forth a little quicker and easier good okay that's great very very good what a great thing to work on. Now, shall we tackle lock the gar? I think we should. Or as Sandy McIntyre calls it, lock the car. 
Uh, so first of all, we should get in the D major mood. So let's do a D, really nice, the best D major scale you've ever done in the arpeggio afterwards. We'll start on D, go all the way up to high A, all the way down to low A, and uh, the arpeggio as well. Get my tuner back on here. So I can keep us all honest. Okay, here we go. D major, ready to go. Okay, let's do our arpeggio. We'll start on the low A and then it's going to be D. Ready? Go. One more arpeggio for the strengthening. Ready, go. so happy about their D. It's great. You know, you gotta love D. Somebody told me once it's the first note I play when I get my fiddle out of the box every time it seemed to annoy that person. Anyway, <laughs> lock the car. Let me see. I gotta get it out here on the book and we will talk about it. Where is it at now? Uh, Dan? Yeah. If you have it online, would you be able to email it? I'll do it right away, no problem. Thank you so much. Not at all. Let's see, Lock Nagar. Where is it? It's actually a Stras Bay. Or is it a Stras Bay or a March? Maybe it's a March. Nobody ever plays it like that. Everybody plays it like an air. Where is it in here? I know it's in here. Page 42. Page 42. Oh yeah, right. In the Thousand Fiddle Tunes book. My God. Okay, I'll send it to you, Simone. It's small, man. <laughs> oh, actually, I have the whole... I'll send you the, the whole uh, the whole book. Did you send it to me as well? I don't have it either. Yeah, no problem. Thank uh, you. Okay, so there's Marie... Here we go. Go to folder, this is the Dropbox folder, and I'm gonna send it. Share. So that is Simone and Pearl. T dot shaver. Okay, so I have now sh uh, shared the whole book with you. And I'm just going to also just uh, share my screen so everybody can see the music too. So you don't have to go looking. I just want to find it here. Okay, page 42. Let's see.
okay, this is taking forever. I'm just going to take a picture. <laughs> Share my screen. Oh, there's Jay. Yay! Hurry for Jay. Okay, make this as big as I can. Can everybody see that? It's not that big, I know. I can make it bigger. Oh, too big. There. Can everybody see that okay? Good? Okay. So very simple tune, eh? It goes down to the arpeggiate scales. And then we got this little section here, this middle phrase. And this E part. See, and then it does it all again. Up we go. And then there's a landing. And that's the first part. It's not very complicated. Why don't we give it a go? Okay, just the first part. We're going to go nice and slow and see if we can get this first part here. You guys can keep track of my intonation now. Give me a hard time if you see any red. Okay, let's go nice and slow. Ready, two, three. particular problems with any of that. Now you hear the slight dotted rhythm, eh? Now, do you notice how it's called Highland Scottish? Okay, has anybody ever heard of a Scottish before? No, I, I didn't even hear of it when I was a kid in Cape Breton. It's not until I came to Toronto and st started playing with Irish people that pe people started asking me to play, would you would you ever play a Scottish, Dan? And I didn't know what the hell they were talking about. And it's it's basically a, it's a dance, and it's basically a Strass Bay, but it's not quite as fast, okay? So usually a Scottish, and, and it came, apparently it's it's from up in Donegal, where, where Scottish people taught Irish people music, and this is kind of their interpretation of a Strass Bay. But it's, it's usually played like this. See, that's what it's kind of, it's not usually played like that, but that's what you're supposed to do with it. And that's what a Scottish is. It's got that kind of rhythm. Slightly dotted. Now, I love to keep the dots in when I'm playing it as a Strass Bay. I do as Sandy did too. I got it off of him, you know. And it's a really nice, subtle thing. 
So, so keeping the dots in as much as you can, but subtle. So it's not like this. Just, just subtly keeping them in there, okay? So let's try that first part again with that in mind. And you're gonna try to lengthen and make a, the best sound you can. A one, two, three. should say that the way I got it off of Sandy I didn't real I never read it <laughs> I just got it by ear and he did the last part a little different than what it's written what it's written is this but he always played it like see that short notes in the middle okay it's nice I love it I'd never play it a different way just to let you know we'll play it as written for now now let's see about the second part it's my favorite bit. Now we have more of this double E, double D idea that we do twice in the first part. And I love that reprise. And then we got this part that I just love. It's just such a beautiful resolution see that and it but it doesn't even resolve it, it leaves you hanging but it still resolves in such a nice way and then we go up to the high A and I, I really think that's kind of the climax of the tune there and then we got another kind of semi climax and then we got the last phrase sense this tune okay so let's see if we can play this second part with those few things in there double E double D that part in the middle and all these descending lines at the end okay a one two three
favorite note again. Okay, so how's everybody feeling about that second part? Any problems or weirdnesses? No? Great. Yes, Claire? The third full bar in the B part. Yep. What is that thing that happens in the middle? You mean that little grace note there? Um, I have to say, I have a different... Okay, mine is written out kind of differently. Oh, yeah? Because there's no... When I tried to enlarge this so that it was actually visible, um, it became so distorted and misty that I couldn't even read it, so... I had to download it from somewhere else. Like the actual notes are the same, but there's something different written in that part. Oh, you want to play it for me and see what it is? Yeah, yeah. You know what? I can see this one kind of, so I think I'm just going to change mine to equal this. Okay. Because in the one that I have, somebody's written it out ineptly yeah. so that there's actually too many beats in that bar. <laughs> oh, yeah. Is that on session.org? Yeah. Yeah, I read Every into that. Every note is the same, but one of that one rhythmic thing is not the same. I see. And that's the only thing that's different. Well, I would definitely trust this this one here because it's from the book yeah. from eighteen whatever. So. Yeah. And it's probably sounds like a small difference. Uh, yeah, but, it's very small. But and it's the only difference. I just couldn't see it. Sure, and but the rhythm, just to be clear. The rhythm is, it's kind of interesting, it's all long sandwiches right through that whole thing. You see that? This is a long sandwich, this is a long sandwich, this is a long sandwich. So that takes some of the guesswork out. <laughs> okay? Shall we try the whole thing? Any other bits or pieces that anybody needs help with before we try the whole thing? Okay, let's do it then with plenty of feeling. Oh, somebody is chatting. Where's the chat window? Here we go. My internet is very bad tonight, so I have turned off the video. It is not helping me very much. I get it, Jay. No problem, man. Yeah, check out what I'm having for lunch tomorrow. Oh, show these guys here what you just made. <laughs> You're getting applause. <laughs> nice one. Good job, buddy. Great lunch for yourself. Okay, here we go. Lock the car. Lock the car. A one, two, three.
right, how are people feeling about Loch Nagar? Here, I'll stop sharing so I can see you. How's everybody feeling about that? Anybody having any problems? Yes, Sue? I just get a little bit um, off time on that uh, that second full bar on the first line, that tied E going into that double, no, it's an E, oh, it's an E, E slur down to the D. Uh, First of all, ignore the slur. Ignore the slur. Okay. Yeah. And, and I, you know, whenever you see slurs written into Scottish and Irish music, they're only suggestions. There's a million ways to bow the I tune. Think I, I think I was seeing that as a tied E, but it's not a tied No, e it's two separate E's there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Same as, or later on as well. I think it's just the small print was giving me some trouble. It's very small. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else having any bits or pieces they need help with? Now, I gave you a few ideas for double stops there the last time around, right, that you might want to put in. One of the really nice ones in this tune, and it's such a good one to practice anyway, is what I start off with, the big D that starts off the tune, and I play a low A with it. So it sounds like this. And I find that's a really good, powerful one. See that? It's a fourth. Low A and open D together. And then when, as I move along, uh, this idea of the F sharp and the A together, eh? And then a big octave. Uh, that's really nice there. And then I calm down off of it. But then when I go to the F sharp, I have trouble. Whenever I hit an F sharp with the key of D, I usually play the A with it. And also that one, see that? I play the A with that one too. E and A together, really nice. You know, these are only choices. And then we got a big octave in the second part. And you hear how I'm playing the E1, sorry, the F sharp there, with the open A. And then the octave there, see that? And then more D string. See that? Now this octave in the middle, so that's the two D's in the middle of the part. That playing an octave there, I would say, is kind of important because it's a it's a really poignant part of the tunes. And it really beefs it up nicely there. Now, in these delicate little descending lines, I never do any double stops. Because I want it to be clear and nice. And sometimes I do a grace note there when I go from one to open, my usual. And then what then after those are over, I would I would introduce them again. Now, the last note of the tune, you could most certainly play an octave. nice and strong. You could also play an F sharp. So that's F sharp and D together. Beautiful. It's beautiful. But I never do. I always play the D on its own. It's, I just love it so much. Sometimes my friend Kim here was a fan of the fifth at the end of that. Also beautiful. Really nice. Harder to hit. <laughs> in tune but it's beautiful now it's not something you would want to do if you were playing it on your own I wouldn't do that if I was playing it on my own because it would be too open-ended 
I would do it if I was playing with people and they were playing that low A or that octave, and I would add that fifth on top to be a to be a color. See see what I mean by that? Anyway, now I saw you guys diligently writing all that down, so now you you probably have a decent plan to dress up this tune. Now, like I said, I did a lot on purpose. Uh, so that you would have stuff to choose from. But be sparing with your double stops, okay? It's one of the only things that, that differentiate, differentiates us from the bluegrassers. And we hold on to those things very tightly. We don't want to be confused, you know what I mean? Anyway, let's give this one more try. You're going to try to put some dress-up stuff in there if it's possible. <laughs> some dress up stuff in there did you manage to get anything in there a little bit oh that's great very very good okay cool so now let's do uh, let's leave that and leave you guys to practice that with you know sound production intonation more bow the usual and we'll take a look at it again next time and maybe we'll stick something on there but I remember last time we were practicing stool of repentance so why don't we get that out and take a look at that. I'm going to go grab my drink. I'll be right back. Dokie, stool of repentance. Okay. <laughs> So 
So let's start off slow, because I know that it's been a while for this one. We did it a little bit last week, but not very much. So let's start off nice and slow. We'll do it a good couple of times slow, and then we'll see if we can up it. All right. Okay, nice and easy. Ready, and... problems in the way of going faster <laughs> let's have a go at it then shall we let's try it about here okay let's do it one two three go
are we doing at that speed? Anybody have difficulty at that speed? How'd you do there, Claire? I know speed is what you're working on. Speed is what I'm not working on. <laughs> <laughs> and like, that's why it's so hard. <laughs> Were you able to play it at that spe speed, though, for the most part? A couple of speed bumps? Okay. Yeah, well, we'll keep working on it for sure. Anybody having any problems that I can help with before we try to go a bit faster? It occurs to me a tune that we're going to learn that will go with this beautifully and is in the same key. And, it, and the reason I thought of it is because uh, people play the first part and second part swapped a lot with this tune as well. Calliope House. Have you ever heard of that tune? It's beautiful. Let me play it for you for a little break. You guys look like you need a little break. Uh, how does it go? Richardson of the Boys of the Lock. And if you don't know the Boys of the Lock, you should go on Spotify or whatever the hell you use these days, even YouTube, and find Boys of the Lock. They're the longest running Celtic band in history, uh, even older than the Chieftains, if you can believe that. And Dave Richardson was their leader, and he wrote that tune, among other tunes. He also wrote Music for a Found Harmonium. You ever hear of that? tune. Oh, that's a wicked tune. <laughs> It's awesome, and, and he wrote it for the Boys of the Lock, and this movie called Napoleon Dynamite, very, very funny movie, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but they used it in the movie, and they didn't call Dave, and Dave got a big payout because of that, big one, from whatever movie company used it, but uh, uh, it was the perfect use for it in the movie, it was excellent. And it's a great movie, but anyway, maybe we'll learn it sometime. It is an awesome tune. There's, it's got like three or four parts, it progresses. It's really, really neat, but it's for another time. What was that tune called? It's called Music for a Found Harmonium. Oh. Yeah, I don't know why it's called that. I do know Dave, though. He was very nice to me. He's an old friend of my family's, but when I was finished one of my Magic of Ireland tours years and years ago, this Portuguese guy... Was, a, came, was supposed to join us. He was a baron player and terrible, terrible baron player. Terrible banjo player, worst singer. I had no idea why he was there. Like he, the producer wanted five musicians on the stage, but he did not get the gig. But at the end of it, he was saying to us, I have this Celtic festival in Portugal and other ones as well. And you guys could come over to Portugal and play with me at these festivals and you get 500 euro each for each one and stuff like that. And the other people in my band at the time were like, oh, that sounds great. And two of them actually went. And I called Dave Richardson because I asked my dad, well, should I do this, you know? And he said, well, you know who you should talk to? Dave Richardson. Because they did festivals in Portugal and they had some experiences. 
And so I called Dave, and he was quite nice and kind. And he explained that the festivals he played in Portugal were very disorganized, and he didn't have a ride back to the airport, and they, it was like kind of a disaster. And, and then I, and he said, and who is the guy that's trying to hire you? And I said, well, it's this German guy living in Portugal. And he said, a German folky? Run! Run for your life! Uh, so I didn't go on the tour. Two of my musician cohorts went, and there was no gigs. There was nothing. The guy was hoping that having real Celtic musicians would mean he would get the gigs. And it ended up that October, the lady who was my boss, actually called him out in front of his wife and said, give us the money for the plane tickets right now. And all that, it was just totally ugly. And so I'm really glad I didn't go on that tour. Very, very grateful for, to Dave Richardson uh, for all these years after not going on that tour. Anyway, I've distracted you enough. Let's try Stool of Repentance a little bit faster. Claire, you're just going to keep that bow moving, man, no matter what. All right. That's right. <laughs> Fake it till you make it. Oh, Pearl, I see your text here. So most of my problems can be fixed getting more familiar with the tune. Very good point. My best advice to that, try to sing it in your head as often as you can. All the details. Try to get everything in your head. And if you don't have it, go back to the music. Here we go. Okay. Oh, one, two, three, and... trying to think of another jig that we did that we can practice. Anybody got any ideas? I can't seem to find my repertoire list. 
what jigs have we done in the past that we that we could practice tonight and get a little stronger? Did we do? Did we ever do the swallowtail? Let's do that. Let's practice the swallowtail. You never did that one, Sue? Oh no! Really good one. Really, really good one. Let's see if we can hear. I'll find a good version for you. I have a good version. I'll just send it to you quick here. Oh, here's this Monday fiddle repertoire. <laughs> okay. So, this is Swallow Tail. Yes. Okay, I just sent it to you there, Sue. Swallowtail jig. You'll get it in a second. It is so easy. Let me play it to remind everybody how's it go. <laughs> So let's work up the swallow tail here. Let's see if we can get her back from uh, from the brink. We'll go slow, okay? No reason to go fast at first. So let's see about here. Ready? Two, three.
everything's looking pretty good there. Anybody having any problems getting that back under the fingers? For some people, it may have been a while. It's all good? That's great. This is definitely one we can get up and going at a decent tempo, okay? For sure, because people did not seem to be having many difficulties there. Definitely not anything we can't solve and conquer, as it were, all right? So that's really good, guys. It was very, very good workout tonight. I worked you guys hard, and I think we'll leave it there. Next, next time we'll work on Loch Nagar again. Uh, is see if we can dress it up a little. That's, you know, it's not a hard tune, but you want to make it into something. See if we can get, we'll put those two jigs together, the swallowtail and the, uh, and the stool of repentance. We'll put them together. We'll put the stool of repentance after the swallowtail. I think it's going to be a great change. So think about that in your practicing this week, putting those two jigs together. And then uh, we might learn a new one next week. It's been, you know, ages since we learned a new tune, so we've been doing all this strengthening work. So we'll learn a new one. We'll learn Calliope House. I'll find a decent version on session.org and send it out and I'll make videos of it and stuff like that. And that's what we'll do next week is I feel like we need a little boost of new material, you know, something to get in there and mix it up a little bit. But I'm glad that we're doing all this strengthening work because it is very, very important, especially if you want to get a decent tempo and stuff like that. All right. The other thing is, Thursday night, Dora Keos, North Atlantic Drift Session, early and late, starts at 7, goes till whenever, and uh, it's we're allowed full capacity. So everybody that wants to come, come on down. If you're vaxxed, you can come in and try playing. It would be wonderful to see you. Okay? Okay, thanks a million, everybody. See you next Monday. Thanks, Dan. All right, thank you, Jay. Bye-bye. Yeah, bye-bye.